Hi guys, my name is Leith McGinnis, and I'm going to talk about uh, polyhedral shapes. Mainly I'm going to talk about this shape here and uh, the shape uh, that I put on top of here. This is actually just a jig for another shape. And most of the video is just going to be process about how I made this and how I went about it. But I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about some of these other shapes. Uh, I'm kind of fascinated with polyhedral shapes, uh, mainly because uh, they're uncompromising and difficult to make and take a lot of planning. It's a very kind of process-oriented craft. Uh, it's, you know, you know, I've been a carpenter for a long time, but making this kind of stuff really, really kind of pushes the limit uh, if you're a carpenter, figuring out how to precisely cut all these angles and get everything to fit together properly uh, is not easy. So that's kind of what kind of attracted me to this originally uh, is, you know, I, I didn't know how these shapes were made. I didn't know what angles I had to use. So I had to, you know, go, go and uh, figure out all this stuff. And there wasn't really, people often think there's lots of math that goes into this. There is a lot of math. Uh, for the purpose of making all this stuff, there really, it's just addition and, subtra and subtraction uh, and a little bit of geometry. It's really not much. Figuring out all the angles for this stuff, uh, I mainly got off of Wikipedia. Uh, I went there to get the angles and I would kind of check it. And I modeled all this stuff on the computer too, just for fun and just to kind of see how things would fit together and, you know, verify that, you know, uh, this shape will su would support this shape. Uh, and the reason I ended up making this shape is when I was making uh, the icosahedron and the dodecahedron, I made these with the aid of a support structure. So this is a rhombic triac contrahedron. And I made this to make these two sh uh, uh, to make these two shapes. And this is a wireframe shape, by the way. The difference between these two shapes, these are both icosahedrons. This is a solid shape, and this one is a wireframe shape. And this one is defined by its vertice. This one's hollow in the middle, and this one is solid. So in the process of making these two shapes, I made the rhombic triacontahedron. And after I finished making these shapes, I kind of got interested in, well, how would I make the rhombic triacontahedron in, wire, in, in a wireframe form? And then I started kind of doing some research and figured out that in order to make that shape, I would have to make a support structure. Uh, and this is the support structure. This is called a deltoidal hexacontahedron, 60 sides. Uh, this has 60 sides, 60 sides, 20, 20, 12, so I figured out that this is the shape that I would need in order to create the wireframe rhombic triacontahedra. So, you know, I went online, figured it out, I modeled it on the computer using, a, I use SolidWorks on the computer to model all this stuff. So I also modeled uh, this shape on the computer just to kind of verify that, you know, <laughs> all the angles were correct and, you know, uh, well not just these angles, but also the angles made in between them. Uh, you know, it's always, that's the nice thing about using software is CAD software is you can kind of, you know, definitively verify all this stuff and not, you know, wait until, you know, far down the road in the process that you've made some kind of mistake. Because in SOLIDWORKS, you know, they'll tell you if something doesn't fit, they'll let you know that something's wrong. So that's kind of neat to be able to, to be able to run it and just kind of, you know, verify that you're, that you're good. Uh, you know, I put a little construction line in here. To measure the distance from tip to tip, uh, just to verify, uh, you know, the size for the piece that had to go in there. And to make this shape, I had to I had to piece all these together. You know, I had to tell the computer, you know, this, you know, mate with this one and this one and this one and all the way around. It probably took maybe 45 minutes to make this. I mean, to to assemble them. This is called an assembly. Uh, one of the neat things about SolidWorks is I can change, uh, you know, this. And that change propagates throughout the piece. So if I make, if I make, put a hole in the middle here, it makes a hole in every single one of them. So uh, that's kind of good too if you're trying to uh, save time. Uh, for a lot of stuff, you don't have to model it. It was just helpful for me because I had to make, uh, I had to figure out how the clamp was going to fit in here, and I made these special, uh, I made these special clamps to go in here. Uh, these are available, uh, only I think. Uh, makes them. 
Uh, but I needed a whole bunch of them because I had to cover. Uh, I, I made two of these, so I had to cover. You know, I had so you know, 60 sides times all these joints. That was a lot of them. It was going to be really expensive. So I ended up making these myself. This is 1080 steel. Uh, I just cut them all aside. to make these points sharp so they would stick in here and I had them heat treated. The cost of, a, of the steel uh, was about I don't know, $25 or something and then the heat treat was probably $100. So the rest of it was just my time and I, I had uh, I just had a whole box of them I, I, I made here and I had maybe three or four hundred of them made. So it was just 125 bucks plus my time. So and they work out great. Uh, the heat treat is to make them flexible so when you make them they don't, they bend and that's it. They don't bend the spring back. So once, as soon as you heat treat them, you know, that, then they kind of, uh, they, uh, they spring. So this shape here is a rhombic hexagon tahedron. Uh, this, 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 is a, this one is pretty tough to make. I made this one, and this is kind of a kind of funny how these two fit in here. It's kind of funny in in, in once you start looking at polyhedral shapes, how certain shapes complement other shapes. So, so anyway, so this is this. Well, I'm going to get into this and talk about how I made this. I had to make a a jig, a whole other jig, to clamp these things down and cut them at these different angles. One of the challenges with this piece is. You know, unlike uh, the, the dodecahedron or the icosahedron, these two ends were different. This is a compound angle, right? So this angle and this angle uh, are unique. And then on this end, it's a, whole, it's a whole different angle. So I had to reset this angle and this angle. So that was kind of an added challenge uh, compared to other shapes that I've made. All right, I said before you don't need much math to make these shapes, but in this instance, I'm using a spindle square and a sine bar, and I'm using uh, trigonometry to change the angle of the head, and that gets the end mill, uh, the cutting surface, uh, at the correct angle uh, up against the wood. And there I am kind of positioning it, getting it ready. So after I uh, changed the angle of the head and got the end mill at, at the correct angle, I then had to figure out, you know, how far to, you know, on the rotary table, you know, how far, how far do I have to rotate this thing around? So, you know, you make your first cut, that's easy, but then, how far do I rotate this to, to you know, for, for the next angle? And then, and then I get to rotate it to here, but then this the whole thing has to go forward because this whole thing is not, the distance from here to here is not the same as the distance from here to here. So I had to compensate for that. So I had to move the whole bed forward a little bit, and then I had to go to here, and then I had to, when I got to here, I had to bring it back again. So I had to kind of, that's, I, that's why, I, why I made this model here in SolidWorks is just to kind of, you know, double check all my numbers. Uh, well, not to double check my numbers, but to figure out the numbers. Uh, you know, how many degrees and minutes do, uh, do I turn this? And how far forward in thousands of in inches do I move it forward and then bring it back? And I had a digital readout, so, you know, that kind of simplified, you know, changing the, you know, the, the bed axis. Uh, but I made this to just to kind of double check and you know, once I had degrees, I had, you know, I had to convert that into uh, degrees and minutes for the rotary table. And these are the notes that I took that, that uh, kind of told me how to navigate, how far to go and stuff. So you might notice that some of these pieces that I, uh, that I bolt down to the, uh, the rotary table, 
and that I stand that you see uh, part of the jig, they don't all look the same. Some are laser cut with holes and some have holes that are drilled. And the reason is I went through this whole process two times. Uh, the first time that I did it, uh, after I made all 60 pieces on the milling machine, I, I pulled them off and before I put them together, I, I kind of sanded them down uh, and I ended up sanding down the, the sharp edges where they all come together. Uh, I don't know why I did that. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I thought that maybe when I glued them together, that would be make it glued together better. Anyway, it was a mistake. And so I went through this whole process two times. So my assembly strategy for this jig was to uh, prefab these pentagonal shapes uh, out, of, out of the pieces and make, you know, make all these shapes and then assemble uh, the, the pentagonal shapes together. So this is just normal wood glue. Uh, I like to use uh, Type Bond 3. Uh, it has a little bit more working time than uh, the other Type Bond glues and I've had good luck with it, uh, so uh, that's what I use. The reason I'm using C-clamps there is uh, that last piece had a little bit of trouble and I needed a little bit more pressure. So yeah, that's why I've got those clamps, the C-clamps there. So this is the fixture that I made to cut the pieces of wood that will, that will be mounted to the jig. And this is a half inch piece of aluminum. I drilled a series of holes. Uh, in the plate and a series of holes in the fence and I put drill bushings in the fence and then I use uh, dowel pins that locate the fence at the right angle. So all the other holes are for or to put the fence at different angles if you want to make maybe another shape. I, I made it you know so I can make other shapes besides this one and I drilled and tapped holes uh, to hold down the fence and I drilled and tapped holes uh, for those, uh, those toggle clamps to hold down the piece while it's being cut. So to figure out where to drill, to drill and tap all the holes, I just went on the computer and I just used coordinates from the top and from the center. And uh, the series of holes on the left is just a mirror of all the series of holes on the right. And I just uh, printed out the coordinates. And here I am machining uh, the fence to go on and uh, the fixture. So this is the protractor that I used to uh, get the angle of the blade uh, perfect. And this one is micro adjustable, so I can, uh, I can adjust the minutes uh, on the angle. And this is a, uh, a Fowler uh, protractor uh, made in Japan. So the pieces were all, all right on the money and they fit, uh, they fit pretty well. 
so I so I built up the shape, and uh, you know, I did this two times, of course, and I let it dry, and then I assembled them all later. I did have a little bit of trouble when I went to put both pieces together. Uh, there was a little. I did have to kind of you know force. There had to, yeah, to apply a little bit of force to kind of get them to fit together. One mistake I made here was I left this thing outside in the sun. I thought it would help it uh, dry faster, and it did. However, the, the UV uh, light kind of left these uh, stains where the clamp was clamped, and I had to I had to sand it extra hard to get those stains out. So lesson learned. So one regret I had here was using the blue tape. I wish I would have used. Uh, uh, just regular masking tape because a lot, some, little bit of the blue tape ended up getting into the cracks and I had a hard time uh, pulling it out. So here I am cutting uh, 220 grit sandpaper. So I sanded the whole thing to 220 and then I sprayed inside and out with lacquer and then I, I sanded the lacquer with uh, 400 grit sandpaper and then I lacquered the whole thing again. And the lacquer I used was uh, Deft uh, semi-gloss uh, lacquer. Uh, and I used the solvent-based stuff, not the acrylic. Okay. And here it is completed.